fun. So yeah, this chapter right here, um, now, this is physiology. There's no more memorization, you know, with anatomy. We just look at structures and um, organs. This is the start of physiology, which means this is like an, an introduction to 202. All of this information right here, there are, I think there are a lot of questions from this chapter on your final exam. So you're going to have to really, really understand a muscle. On Blackboard, there are some animations out there. Um, so in order, you guys, I recommend that you watch this particular chapter. There are three of them because there's a really, really long question on your final exam about how your muscles contract because you're going to have to know them. So you're going to have to know that. When you get to 202, you're going to start off talking about an action potential in a nerve. Over here, we're going to talk about an action potential in a muscle. So you need to understand the basics. So when you get to 202, you will not be struggling because in 202, they take an action potential to a little bit higher level than over here. Students struggle with this concept because it is physiology. It's not a no longer anatomy. Um, so and your final exam is worth 20%. Some of you are not doing that great in here, um, so just be mindful of that. And that last exam, some of you didn't do so well on. Apparently, I don't know if you didn't study, but I did have I mean, a few students in other classes that did make A's on the test. So. Um, I strongly recommend you not to take that final exam lightly because like I said, it's 20% of your grade and the only thing that's going to be missing going into your final exam will be your grade. So, for your final exam. So always when the last, when you take your final exam, I plug in that grade, whatever you see on the blackboard, that's your average. If you have a 69, you get a D out of the course. You have a 50, get an F. Simple as that. Um, don't don't email me saying what can I do to get that extra point because I don't do that. If you, I mean, whatever you put in, what you put into this is what you're going to get out. So my thing is, I strongly believe that. I'm I'm, be, I'm honest and I'm a realist. So if you put in 50% and your average is 50%, that's you get an F and you have to take it over. So I don't give extra stuff for you to do. What are you going to tell me about the history of anatomy or something? But I just tell students you didn't master the concepts like you should, so they typically have to repeat it or take it over. No point intended. Okay. But it's just business. It's just the way I do things in my class. Um, I don't know other people. Everybody's different. So we're gonna. I put this. Always put this on the board before I start talking about because with all of these terms, you're gonna have to know what an action potential is. You have to know what a stimulus. Your two regulatory proteins, troponin and tropomyosin, are involved in a muscle contraction. The contractile proteins or actin and myosin, they're going to be involved. Calcium, ATP, of course, you always need energy in order for your muscles to contract. You also need ATP in order for your muscles to relax. The most um, important thing up here that's going to cause that action potential prior to your muscles contracting is going to be the sodium-potassium pump. Um, there has to be a neuron attached to a muscle and, of course, you're going to have to have acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. When you guys get into anatomy 202, this is just one neurotransmitter that we're talking about over here. When you get to 202, you're going to talk, these are chemicals, okay? You're going to talk about dopamine, serotonin, substance P, um, acetylcholine again, epinephrine, norepinephrine. You actually can take it to a higher level in 202 when it comes to a lot of the stuff about to look at over here in chapter 9. Okay, 
So I'm, about, I'm just going to erase all of this. So I'm going to start off. Yeah, I thought I started with chapter. I did a little bit of stuff in chapter 10 with my uh, Saturday book. But I don't think I have to record it. I'm going to have to go back and record it. Chapter 10 just deals with all of those muscles, which I don't, I can't teach muscles like I can't teach the bones. So I just kind of touched on the clinical parts of um, chapter 10 on Saturday. But I had my microphone on, but I think I hit, forgot to hit the nothing there. Um, I can't remember. Okay. So, here we go. Um, movement, of course, muscles attached to bone to allow us to move from place, place to place, which is a characteristic for all living what organisms. There are three types of muscular tissue. We did talk a little bit about these in Chapter 5, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. I will say this, that um, you need to know which which ones are involuntary. We know skeletal muscles are what? Voluntary because they're, we have conscious control over um, movement. Um, they're striated. Um, cardiac and smooth, of course, they're both involuntary. We have no conscious control over those particular muscles um, contracting. They just do it. It's unconsciously done. Okay. Um, cardiac, we know, is a also a striated muscle. It's important to understand muscle at the molecular, cellular, and tissue levels of organization. So we've looked at the tissue levels. Now we're about to look at the molecular and the cellular level. You can't see any of this happening. Guys, it's just so unfortunate. <laughs> but um, cardiac and smooth. Cardiac muscle does not no nerves to stimulate it. Our heart muscle, which is cardiac muscle that we're talking about here, the cardiac heart, does not need a nerve to stimulate it because it has a built in pacemaker. So when our heart is trying to call auto The heart, of course, is going to contract when we're sleeping. The heart is going to contract when we are awake. Um, it never stops. It just keeps going to keep contracting. So I want to bring that to your attention. Um, same thing with the smooth muscles. Um, when you guys get to CO2, some of these smooth muscles we do have a nerve attached to it, and when we don't have a nerve supply attached to it, we're going to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, the dynamic nervous system, and then we're going to compare or relate the smooth muscle a lot to the autonomic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay? Some smooth muscle has no nerve supply or what? Okay? So um, some of these right here, smooth, don't have a nerve supply. Some lack nerve supply. That's what you need to know about the cardiac. Most of our time over here is going to be spent on skeletal muscle. Okay. This is what this entire chapter, now towards the end, it talks a little bit about cardiac and smooth. I really don't get off into that. To me, you're going to talk more. There's an entire chapter on the circulatory system. There's an entire chapter on um, the whatever that chapter is in 202 that talks about smooth muscles. So you're going to get a good foundation. If you take the right person <laughs> for um, anatomy 202, of course, I strongly recommend Dr. Um, Tracy Wilson to teach to take 202 because you're going to need that foundation for whatever first profession you go into. So, are you going to be a high teacher? You're going to have to teach me which most students do. They always complain. Uh, well, I can do it in Dr. Wilson's course. Now, in this class, I can teach it myself. Well, I hope you're going to be a high teacher.
clear comparison with specific options that allows all stop and talk about the what so on page 402 of your test textbook, okay? One thing you need to remember in order, the first thing that's going to happen when your muscle, prior to your muscle contracting, it has to be excited. There has to be a stimulus there. It says to chemical, it has to be excited by a chemical signal. The chemical signal over here is going to be a neurotransmitter, okay? A stretch, of course. Electrical changes across the plasma membrane. Those electrical changes are talking about across the plasma membrane was going to be caused by the sodium potassium pump. Those are the electrical changes uh, they're talking about in the plasma membrane. And of course, um, an action potential in the nerve that leads to an action potential in the muscle. But once those electrical changes take place, an action potential will occur because there's going to be a change in voltage across the plasma membrane of the, um, the muscle is going to actually cause that action potential. Muscle cells respond with electrical changes across the membrane. The class plasma membrane, of course, in a muscle is called a sarcolemma. We're getting ready to talk about um, the structures or the organelles that's found in the muscle. Conductivity is another important concept. Um, local electrical change triggers the wave. So the wave of the electrical activity causes that action potential. Um, the local electrical charges change triggers that travels rapidly along the cell. The cell, of course, is going to be your muscle cell or muscle fiber that's going to initiate processes leading to what? Contraction. Contractility, once that um, action potential, of course, reaches that um, muscle, the muscle is going to shorten, which means it's going to contract. So when you do elbow flexion, of course, your biceps are going to what? Contract. Typically, like if you do elbow flexion, you have a dumbbell, a 10-pound dumbbell in both of your hands, and you lift it to do what? Flexion. You're going to see your biceps are going to what? Shorten. But you your, your biceps are going to what? Extend. Um, which leads us to what? Extensibility. Um, so what's going to happen is, like I said, in order for the muscle to contract, the muscle has to pull on the bone in order for that to what occur. Okay. The contractility is caused by collagen proteins. Caused by collagen proteins. Um, of course, the next thing is extensibility, capable of being stretched between what? Contractions. Extensibility, we're going to talk about um, a particular protein, elastin, T-I-T-I-N, um, that's going to allow the muscle to contract, capable of stretch between what? Contractions. Um, collagen, once again, prevents the muscle from overstretching. But the great thing about skeletal muscles, they can extend a quite a long distance, but of course they can extend as much as it's made the muscle. Um, in your chapter, they talk about stress and relaxation of the smooth muscles, where they actually give you an example of your bladder filling with urine. Okay. Um, with that bladder filling that you learned that you talked about to expand quite a bit, but at the same time, it can expand a little bit farther than uh, what a skeletal muscle is not. We just want to be able to hold your urine for the same time. It's a little bit, and it just takes a lot to be able to hold your urine. A little bit more stretching going on with um, the smooth muscles. 
Elasticity returns to its original resting length after being stretched. So once your muscle is going to contract, um, and if you stretch it, of course, it's going to recoil back. So your muscles won't be too slack because if it didn't go back to its original position, the muscles will become flaccid. That's the term they use. I think it's in this chapter. Um, it's not standing out the bowl. Now here's, I've already mentioned this right here. They give you a bit of information on um, page 402 into, over into page 403. Like I said, you guys remember this from uh, chapter 5. We know skeletal muscles are voluntary. Um, they're striated, which means you're going to have your alternating light, light and dark bands. These light bands light the eye here. They're called eye bands. Okay. The dark, the A, of course, they're called A bands. Okay? So your I bands over here, another name for I bands, because they're light, is going to be actin. Okay? The A bands over here, they're alternating light and dark bands, is going to be myosin. Now, these two right here, these are your contractile proteins. Because one is light and one is dark, and we're getting ready to talk about it. We're on page 405 of the textbook. If you look on page 405, figure 11, 23, you can see the purple one, which is dark, that's going to be your myosin. The orange one, which is a little bit lighter, of course, in color, is going to be your um, action. Okay? Also, action, of course, they're called thin filament. So they have a lot of names. These are thin filaments. Myosin are thick filaments. If you look at that picture in your textbook, you can actually see that um, one is a little bit thicker than the other. So keep in mind, remember for text purposes, striation, that's when you have your light, your alternating light and dark bands going on over here. Your, um, the light would be your eye band. The light, of course, is acting. The light, of course, is going to be your thin filament. Your dark bands are your A bands. Your A bands, of course, would be myosin. Of course, myosin is, of course, a, a filament. And these two collectively uh, make up your contractile protein. Oftentimes, we think that when your muscles are shortened, it's because of acting and myosin. But that is not always the case. Acting and myosin, of course, they slide past each other, which is called the sliding filament theory. You guys need to be familiar with this for your final exam. Sliding filament theory is simply that a theory where acting and myosin typically slide right past each other. But what's going to be short is going to be sarcomere. Sarcomere, of course, are D lines. That's what you intersect the uh, your Yeah. 
birth back to chapter 10. Um, and Muscle tendons are attachments between muscle and bone matrix. And of course you have an epimyosin. Epi means on top, carry means around, endo means within. Now with an epimyosin, of course an epimyosin is going to have an higher muscle belly. The higher muscle belly is going to have an impaired epimyosin. Going to keep the little individual muscle fibers actually bundled together and it's called fascicles, which is going to find the same by the way. And of course, the myosin, of course, is going to be the individual muscle fibers. Which is the first one. I'm go back to that. I'm going to show you what this actually looks like. Um, so at the beginning of Extensible, so we're going to go over the 
that you left it. Okay. Stretch it slightly under tension and it's going to recoil back. You don't want your muscle to overstretch. So that's where collagen comes into play. We know it's a protein. We talk about it in the exercise. It reduces protects the muscle from what? Injury. Returns it to its resting length. Um, contributes to power output and muscle what? Efficiency. Collagen keeps it from what? Overstretching. So these are organelles, of course, a muscle cell or a muscle fiber that you need to be familiar with. As I stated before, a sarcolemma, of course, is a plasma membrane around the cell. A sarcoplasm, of course, is a cytoplasm. Um, you know, a cytoplasm is found in a plant or an animal cell that you guys should have talked about when you took biology 103, but over here we call it a sarcoplasm. Myofibrils, of course, contain glycogen. Glycogen, of course, you guys should have studied in biology 103, of course, is a polysaccharide or a complex sugar that's needed when you do um, extensive or intense workouts, you're going to heat need glycogen stored in abundance to provide energy with, for what? Heightened exercise. So glycogen, of course, is so as you know that from biology 103. Myoglobin, of course, is the red pigment that gives the color to muscle. It's responsible for um, transporting oxygen um, in the muscle, which is needed for heightened activity as well. Okay? Multiple nuclei, of course, muscle fibers are considered multinucleated. Uh, myoblasts, of course, are stem cells that actually form to form a fuse to form a muscle fiber. I thought they had a picture in your textbook, but of course they don't. Um, satellite cells. Satellite cells, guys, these are actually cells that if you injure your muscle, such as if you strain a muscle or if you tear a tendon or a ligament or something of that sort, of course your satellite cells are going to help in the repair process. Multiply, produce new muscle fibers to somewhat degree. Have a lot of mitochondria. Of course, the mitochondria is responsible for produce, pr producing what? Um, the ATP, which is needed for uh, muscles. To Sarcoplasmic reticulum, which you need to be familiar with because I'm going to ask you guys questions um, about. I typically do when I do a review of this. I ask you these questions about uh, the process, the entire process of muscle contraction and what's needed. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, of course, is over here. Remember, in the guys of biology 103, we talked about an endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth and the rough you are. Over here, the endoplasmic reticulum is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The actual is the reservoir that stores the calcium. These are in the The reservoir for what? Calcium. Calcium activates the calcium what? Process. Calcium is so important in activating the muscle contraction process because what's going to happen is calcium is going to bind to that regulatory protein called the conin. And of course, the conin, which is covering those active sites. It's going to actually work to hold tropomyosin is covering those active sites. Tropomyosin wants calcium binds to troponin. Tropomyosin is going to expose those active sites in order for the myosin here to actually what? Attach to it. If you um, look like at the bottom of page 404, um, you need to highlight that. The SR is a reservoir of calcium ions. It has fluted channels in its membrane that open at the right time to release a flood of calcium into where the cytosol, which is the cytoplasm, which activates the muscle contraction what process. You have the T-tubal signal to start the plasma and to release what? These calcium bursts. So your T-tubal, the calcium is actually going to travel the length of the T-tubal prior to reaching the um, component of the actual what? Muscle. That's uh, a triad in your textbook, now you can see figure 11.04 has 
how that muscle is to showing you your zebras, the I band, the A band, the muscle fiber, the soccer pass and the tip down, and then you have what you call it, a uh, thyroid. Of course, you have your what? Your two fugles. That's going to um, make up the triad. Five means three because you have the two commas, the sternum, and you have your fugles. You have the lemma, which of course is in this yellow, which is the, um, the plastic wrapped around the uh, muscle fibers or your myofilaments and of course you have your sarcoplasm underneath it which is your cytoplasm mitochondria you got your myofilaments house myofilaments are what are myofilaments name the two myofilaments myofilament action very good so here your thick film is here. Okay, what color are thick filaments? Let's see if y'all are paying attention now. What color are thick filaments? I wrote it on the board. Hmm. They're purple, They're purple right? Uh, what are your thick filaments? What do you call them? Call them the A bands. The A bands. Thank you, Takia, for being an active participant. Uh, what's another thing for, another name for the A-band? Tell me something about those thick filaments because it's on your test. Bore for nothing for sure. Thick filaments are the dark band. Mm-hmm. A-band and the mild band. Okay. What else? Contractile proteins. Uh huh. What else? They're thin. What else? Um, so here are your thick filaments here. It's, it looks like a golf club. If you know that letter A, the myosin molecule, yeah, it has a head. The head is what's going to attach to the active side of course one active. Um, and it has two things. The uh, tails, as you can see, are intertwined in the shaft like tails. And like I said, you can see how the head is projecting. You have some head projecting outward, and you have some head actually like projecting inward. They call it a helical array around what? The bongo. Some are going right, some are projecting inward, some are going right, and some are going left. left. This is your thin filament. So we're leading up to some. Your thin filaments are called five or F action. You have strands here. Now, what did I tell you about cooking bison and cooking burgers? You should have it in your nose. The what? The regulatory proteins. Those are your regulatory proteins. They're going to what? Regulate. They're going to determine when your muscles can contract or when they won't what contract. So for example, a good example would be if you don't write notes from the board and you're just sitting there looking at me, what happens is your muscles are not contracting. Okay? So this is what your muscles the thin filament is going to look like when your muscles are relaxed because you're not writing. Okay? But the myosin, which is this baby blue rope here, it's going to be covering those active sites. And of course, the component, of course, sits on top of what? 
sulfamycin. However, if you decide to write the notes on the board that I, from the board that I write on the board, and your muscles and your hands are contracting, what's going to happen? Calcium is going to bind to what? Troponin, tropomyosin, of course, is going to remove, to remove, exposing those active sites in order for that other protein. And we'll talk about myosin, the head, to bind to what? The active site. Tropomyosin, each blocking six or seven active sites. You can't see them now because they're what? They're covered up, right? But if you go to page... 415, four, yeah, 414 letter number 9, you're exposed now. You turn to 414 and look at number 9. If you're trying to write all of this, stop it, okay, and listen to me, because you can download these PowerPoints from Blackboard. Turn to page 414. If you look, you can see that the active sites are no longer, what, covered up? Because tropomyosin decided to what? Remove once, if you look at number eight, calcium had to bind to troponin in order for those active sites to be removed. Now, if you look at chapter at number nine, the active sites have now been exposed. What's going to, what's getting ready to bind to those active sites? Now. Keep in mind, this is physiology. It ain't anatomy anymore. It's hard stuff.
Ja. 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 Stories like that. It really is. It's really good to me. Uh uh. I don't think it's real too. Why are you shocked? You knew if you know you made an A, you know you made an A. If you know you made an F, you know you made an F. You know, don't walk out of here saying, um, "I think I did okay." No, you know how you did. You know either you made an A or an F, a C or a B, a D or whatever. You know, 
I don't get it when students say, well, I think. No, you know. I mean, oh Lord, let me turn this thing off. So is this starting to make sense? Okay, let me re let me look, let me erase this. Now somebody tell me these three steps. <laughs> Tamara, I'm gonna start with you. Step number one: What has to happen? Binding of the calcium to what? Calcium binds to uh, troponin. troponin, right? Two. Then the tripomyosin is removed to the active site. Okay, Marcus Coachman, step three. Uh, We're part of the myosin. Yeah. The head. Exactly. So you know those three steps already, right? How easy is that? Highlighting your textbook. Textbook. Myosin and actin, page 405, are called contractile proteins because they do the work of shortening the muscle fiber. Shortening the muscle fiber. Tropomyosin and troponin are called what? Regulatory proteins because they act like a switch to determine when the fiber can contract and when it what? Cannot. Perhaps you are already forming some idea of the contraction mechanism to be explained shortly. You pretty much, yeah, if you know those three steps and you'll be able to complete the other what? Steps. This book is kind of going backwards. Well, I guess it's just giving you a little, a general overview of the contractile proteins and your regulatory proteins. Okay. You also have a third filament. Now, remember your myofilaments are your thick filaments. If you look on page four, four they talk about your myofilaments. Those are your thick filaments. Those are your thin filaments. You also have what you call elastic filaments. Now, the elastic filaments um, has a protein called Titan. It's a springy protein. It's going to help stabilize the thick filament. That's what the elastic filament does. And once again, the elastic filament is going to prevent the, um, the muscle from overstretching. It's going to allow it to stretch. It's, you know, elastic like a rubber band. It's elastic like a rubber band. It's going to allow the muscle to stretch, but at the same time, it's going to keep it from what? Overstretching. Once that muscle stretches when it contracts, it's going to recoil back okay, um, to his original length, that's when your muscles are going to be relaxed, okay? You don't want to keep them overstretched because if they're overly stretched, remember the term flaccid, your muscles are going to be limp like a noodle or a spaghetti, okay? So to recoil back where? To the, um, this length. And this is what it looks like, guys. This is what your contractile proteins look like. Now, remember, this is called a bare zone, B-A-R-E. A bare zone simply means there are no thin filaments in that region. It's bare, nothing, okay? But you can see how in your thin filament at the top, well, you got one, two, three, thin over here. You got one, two, three over here. So there's kind of sitting above your thick filaments and they're this way for a reason. Now another thing is who am I going to say? Can't remember. Oh yeah. Right here you're gonna have a Z line. I'm jumping the gun a little bit. You're gonna have a Z line right here. Okay? So going from 
one Z line to the next, guys. This is called a sarcomere. So when your muscles contract, this is what shortens. Okay, this is going to shorten. These two right here, your contractile proteins or your thick and thin filaments, they're going to slide past each other. It's called the sliding filament theory. Sliding filament theory. There you have it. Okay, that's step number two for that. The Z lines for your Z disc are going to what? Shorten. But actin and myosin are going to what? Just zip right past each other. Sliding filament theory. They have a nicer picture on page uh, 406 of your textbook. Um, yeah. And they have a lot of definitions also on page 407 of your textbook. Okay, if you look, page 407 to the, the right, it says, what does it say? A muscle shortens because its individual sarcomere shortens and pulls what? page 407 to the right, the upper right column. Sarcomere is shortened and pulls what? The, the yep, and tro dystrophin and the linking proteins pull on the extracellular proteins of the muscle. As the Z disc are pulled closer together during contraction, they pull on the sarcolemma to achieve overall shortening of what? The cell. What's the sarcolemma? The plasma membrane. Okay. So, so far we've covered those definitions. We've talked about a sarcolemma, sarcoplasm, glycogen, myoglobin. We mentioned the T-tubules, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum? It's on page 407, table 11. Point. Yep, it's a reservoir for what? Calcium. We've talked about, mentioned the terminal cisternae. The um, myofilaments, what are your myofilaments? Okay, which are also called, and what else? And what else? I think she said that, and what else? <laughs> Right, exactly. It's got it right there steering you in the face. Contractile proteins, right? Page 407 definitions. Elastic filaments, thin filaments, okay. What are the components of your thin filament? That one is kind of complex. What did you see on your thin filament? What two regulatory proteins? Tropomyosin, very good. And of course, those two orange intertwined strings, it's called what? Actin, right? Myosin. What are, what, 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 how would you describe myosin to a UAB professor? If he says, tell me everything that you've learned at Lawson State Community College about myosin, what would you tell him? Good. Yeah. They're thick. They're dark. Okay. There is a contractile protein and it's what? Myosin. Absolutely. Regulatory proteins. He asks you, tell me something about those regulatory proteins. What would you tell him first? First you need to name them, right? Him like a professor. <laughs> he says, 
okay, well, what has to happen with troponin and tropomyosin in order for your muscles to contract? What would you tell him? But before it moves, what has to happen? Calcium has to bind to troponin. Once calcium binds to troponin, what happens? It's going to reveal those acrocytes. Very good. Okay. Striations. We talked about that. Alternating light and dark transverse bands. Which myofilament is light? So UAB professor asked you that. Which, which myofilament did you learn at Lawson State that's light? Actin or the I band, right? Which one is dark? Good, okay. Z disc. What did you tell him about a Z disc? He's like, now what is the role of the Z disc in muscle contraction? Okay, and what else? When you have two Z discs, what do they call them? I just wrote it on the board. A sarcomere, right? What's a sarcomere? The distance from one Z disc to the next, right? That's going to what? Shorten. Okay, good. So we're moving along pretty good with this. But you know, it's good to have students, some students, some students.